Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Good Stuff. I'm Kevin Billy, and as always, we appreciate you joining us here today. Today, our guest is Cody Royal. We're going to jump in. He's an author. We got two books we're going to discuss, and he's a uh, former coach. He's now a coach of elite head coaches. I'm really excited to have you on today, Cody. What's going on? Hey, Kevin. I'm a little bit upset that I, I don't have my own sign. I've got a picture of Montreal up here, stupidly. I, I should have put my own good stuff sign up there in the background. Yeah, that would have been good. My, my, I, I'm going to start trademarking that. My six-year-old will start making some money, get him ready for college here. Uh, but it seems <laughs> to attract a lot of people. Hey, I, I mean, you just recently got out of coaching here. Um, I, I'm, I'm going I'm, to – I should probably set the timer here, Cody, because I feel like we could talk for three or four hours about a lot of these things. I, I'd just be curious to know right off the bat, what, what made you want to get in coaching in the first place? Yeah, I – I played at a high level Aussie rules football in Australia. Um, the biggest game down there. Um, most people in North America know it from, you know, stumbling home from the bar at 2am and <laughs> flicking on, on ESPN two and, and seeing this crazy game where, you know, the players are wearing short shorts and it doesn't look like there's any rules, but uh, <laughs> there are rules. And so that was my obsession growing up and almost made it played at the, the rep levels all the way up. And then, not getting drafted made me fall out of love with the game and coaching helped me fall back into love with the game. So I, I was basically going to be lost to the sport in less, you know, a, a, a now mentor of mine, you know, that I invited to my wedding and, and we're, we're really close said to me one day, he's like, you understand this game at a level that not, not many others do. Uh, you should coach. And I was 23 at the time and I didn't fully comprehend Right. what he was talking about or what that meant. But uh, yeah, tried it. And then once I saw the, the, the options and the, uh, the, the way that you could mold things and the way that my ideas could translate from my head, um, you know, onto others, I was hooked. So I was yes. 23, 24, 25, just in love with coaching, which is rare in Australia. I, I uh, yeah, I drank from the Kool-Aid too, man. And, but I have a, I have a, I, ironically, I have a story from my wedding that a guy came. He was an NBA ref at the time, and he actually offered to pay for my schooling to go uh, to be a ref and not to be a coach. And I wish I would have taken him up on that. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I'd be I, I'd also be interested to know these next two things. First two part question. Number one, what was the best part about being a coach for you? The best part is the we were talking a little bit about this before we came on there's these nuances about uh, the team that when you pay attention to them are kind of the most meaningful things there's the camaraderie mm -hmm. there's you know I was describing to you earlier there's this sound in the dinner hall and there's this sound in the locker room and there's this smell to it all, and it's it, and all those things kind of mixed together. It's not the X's and O's, and it's not the, uh, you know. There's these really little things that uh, I think we we probably overlook in terms of how important they are to us. But when you sit and reflect back on them, yeah, those the the conversation with a you know a beer at the end of the season with your captain sitting next to you after the the final game and like all those little things is what I I loved the most. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I, that, yeah, yeah, as we as we talked about earlier, I agree. And just that connection piece and relationships and and, and that is hard to describe. Uh, and I I used to tell people too, and still do to this day. Like I just for 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 me with hoops, it was like just going in there for two hours and closing the doors and shutting everything else out. It was, it was just a great thing. Right. On the flip side, then what would, what would you say was the worst part about coaching? Oh, the constant anxiety. Yeah. Like we, we talk about hyper arousal a lot now with phones and social media and everything. And we kind of understand a little bit more about what being in a state of hyper arousal 24 seven does to us. But if you flip that line of thinking over to coaching, we are hyper aroused at all times, whether it's yeah. our own anxiety, whether it's criticism, whether it's, you know, whatever's coming, being in the game, you're just anxious constantly. 
and it it wears on you and and obviously i've i've researched this very closely and done uh, quite a bit of work in this space but that's what i don't miss about it what well, what would you say for i agree um the other thing too for me um i, I always found it especially early on until i understood this you know i i would say well he's uncoachable or he's and i know this is something that you'll you'll have an opinion on but here he, he, it wasn't him it was me but it was really hard at times, you know, with 15 guys in the locker room, you know, those two wanted to see it on the floor. Those two wanted to see it on the board. Those two wanted to see it in video. Those two just dealing with all the different personalities and knowing that when I'm talking, I'm, I'm maybe getting five of the 15 at the time, but I don't know if you felt like, was that a struggle for you at all? And how did you get over that or ever deal with it? So what was really interesting for me, Kevin, was I was in a really unique situation where so none of my guys grew up even watching Aussie rules football. Hmm. So they've all learned it as a second, third or fourth sport. And so most of these guys come out of, you know, NCAA or, or U sports up here in Canada sport. So, you know, rugby, soccer, lacrosse, yep. basketball, hockey. And so I was actually teaching them the game, which was really unique when you think about it at the elite level where most of the time you're coaching someone who's been in basketball their whole life so they understand basically the game as it is and you're just adding the finishing touches whereas I was in a really unique situation where some of my guys were still learning the game and even some of the okay. rules as we were going along but what I actually enjoyed that portion of it because what it made me do is go and learn their first sport and learn their the, the nuances of the movement. So, you know, when I'm talking about putting your hips in front of a defender in Aussie rules to block the space to the basketball players, that makes sense because you you're blocking out to, to make room to grab a rebound. And so I could describe the movement that I was asking using their native sport, but I was learning about the other sport as well at the same time. And so then I could steal other ideas from that sport from watching practice Mm -hmm. You know, I could, if I came to one of your practices, I'd walk away with a ton of Aussie rule stuff to, <laughs> to yeah. try. So I, I actually really, really enjoyed that. But again, that's not something that most coaches yeah. have to deal with. Yeah. Well, the good news is they probably all thought you were a genius, right? I mean, they didn't know any, uh, anything else to compare it to. I mean, <laughs> um, you just, you just chuck hockey stuff in here in Canada, anything related to hockey and everyone's on board immediately. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. That makes sense. Well, I didn't read your first book. I know we're going to talk about the second book for sure, but where others won't, I know you, you wrote that. I guess let's just start there. Like what, what inspires you to write that book, Cody? Yeah. So it was really this world that I was living in at the time, you know, going to, going to work, you know, obviously my, my job wasn't full time. So I'd go to work in corporate environments and look at how they built teams and built culture and led and tried to develop competitive advantage with their people. But at the same time, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, doing that for myself in a high performing team at a, at a national level. So I was living this world seven days a week of what do elite teams look like and how do you develop competitive advantage using people? not using process, not using, you know, anything else available to us out of our people. And so that was the foundational idea. And then I was really lucky to, to get to talk to people like Joe Dumas from the Pistons, who's uh, an absolute great in your sport on both sides, on and off the court. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ted Sunquist, who was the GM of the Denver Broncos, um, Ralph Kruger, who's been a coach and an administrator. He was president of Southampton Football Club in the Premier League and coached the Edmonton Oilers and Buffalo Sabres. So, you know, just add their, their ideas on top of that and ask them how they've built competitive advantage with people as well. Would, would you say, because I'm always telling people, and I know this is biased, but I'm always telling them, man, if you just run your business like a like a sports team, you know, in terms of the roles and the leadership and delegation and, you know, um, all those things. But like, was there was there one or two things that maybe you discovered when you wrote that book that you didn't know beforehand or it was just kind of an aha moment? Like, oh, this this really clicks now. Was there anything that stood out to you, I guess, in the process of that first book? 
Well, the, the big lesson <laughs> was actually uh, my own lesson. And this is the benefit of podcasting or writing a book was I thought from a coaching perspective, my, my idea was just eliminate anyone that doesn't uh, or, or that has like some sort of edge to them, you know, that, that uh, might not be a rule follower and all this kind of stuff. And it was actually Joe that pointed this out to me that he traded for Rashid Wallace. Mm. Um, and, mm. <laughs> and then Rashid ends up becoming the captain of that team. Um, and so, you know, going from the, the player with the most technical fouls, I think still to this day in a season in NBA history, to the captain of the team. And so it kind of challenged this long held notion that I had around teams in that, you know, someone that maybe is a little bit of a disruptor, maybe isn't a rule follower, has an edge to them in the right environment, mm -hmm. you can sculpt that person into a leader. So most technical fouls in NBA history, you can view that, but then becomes the captain of the team. Right. And so it, it wasn't actually like, delving into the corporate staff or delving into anything in particular. It was just this one story that Joe told me that, yeah, basically, you know, I fell off the back of my yes. seat because like I've had this wrong the whole time. Right. Right. Yeah. You've got to get the environment right. Where, where do you, you can poke holes in me here now because now you're taking me back, but when you take over a program, I know I did and you have some of those, maybe bad apples, if you will, let's say like, where, where's the fine line though. And knowing that it's not a fit, you know, cause I, I remember even, and I was seven, eight years in culture was pretty set, took a chance on a kid that was pretty talented, didn't work the whole year, you know? And, and I think at that point it was, it was better for me because I tried a ton of those things, but respectfully at the end of the year, just said, Hey, it's not your fault. This is on me, but this isn't going to work out you know, uh, let's put you in a better environment that suits you. W where's the fine line with that when it, when it comes to coaches and, and, and players or just leaders in general with their employees? Yeah, it is time and maturity. Like that's, that's the right call from you. you. You've, you know, if you've got the, the maturity of the team and what I mean by that isn't their physical maturity or their mental maturity. It's the maturity of the team. How is there strong dynamics between them? Can they, mm. if there is someone who's a little bit different, can they weather that storm and, and bring them with them or are they going to outcast them? So that's what I mean by maturity. And, and you know, yeah. that comes from the time, the time spent together and, and building those, those bonds between people. But then the other thing that I'd say there, Kevin, is that I think we need to give ourselves a little bit of a break in that all of this is a guessing game. And Jeez. for every for every Rashid Wallace, there's the counter example where it doesn't work out. And what we're do we're constantly testing as coaches, it's just these little assumptions that we make. I think we can add a player that gives us an X factor, super talented, but uh, they're not quite you know hundred percent of a cultural fit. But I'm going to try it. And you try it and it doesn't work, but you move on and, and take the learning. So I think we've got to cut ourselves some slack with some yeah. of those tests as well. Yeah, it, it's we're, all, just really, we're all guessing. Yeah, it, it's a, that's a great way of saying it. I, I would agree. Like, how, how do you know, right? You don't, you don't know if that person is going to change or you don't know if you're going to change. Um, yeah. and, and I think when you deal with those things at such a young age, you, you, you definitely don't know. It's like you're throwing up against the wall and trying to get it to stick, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. At the ages we've been talking about it, taking over programs, like you don't even understand how the world works. So, you know, you, what yeah. was that like for you? I, I know for me, Cody, you know, I'm 44 years old now. That was almost 20 years ago. And when I look back at that, um, I mean, I was a good player. I got to play overseas. I'm not by, by no means an elite player, <clears throat> but I would say that coupled with coaching at a young age, I, I deem that you know, early success. And, and I think there are some benefits to that. Don't get me wrong. But when I deep dove a little bit more, th there were some things that that haunted me for a long time that I had to eventually overcome and deal with. Did Do you relate to any of that being a young coach, re regardless of those guys, once again, maybe thought you knew everything because they knew nothing. When you look back on that time now, how do you, how do you relate to it? How do you, how do you process all that? Yeah, it was really weird because you 
you are again you are learning about the world with this group I was the same age and even younger than a lot of my players at the start and so there's these kind of dynamics that you know we aren't necessarily always associated with coaching like being a friend because you're the same age so you would I still wanted to go out to the bar as well. So I'd go out with my players and then like, that's a no, no, right? Like that's kind of one of the, the things in, in coaching and don't become friends, don't go to drinking with or let the assistants go and the head coach, because you might have to cut them and all these different things. And so it was actually really bizarre learning about the world and how the world works and society works with a group of players that then look to you for yeah. kind of the ultimate source of truth. Uh, so that was a bit of a bizarre thing. And then the main thing, I think, which again, maybe we need to give ourselves a little bit of a break is I'm embarrassed at some of the things that I did with training drills and uh, and just some of the, 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 the ideas or the, you know, halftime speeches and, and things like that. But also, I think if you're not, if you don't look back and, and are embarrassed, you haven't changed enough. Uh, yourself and so yeah maybe we need to cut ourselves a little bit of slack like you should be embarrassed by your former coaching in a way yeah as bizarre yeah. as that sounds I'm, I'm i'm not i'm humiliated in fact i think i sent a text this past thanksgiving to like 75 plus players just apologizing for the version they had at that time uh it, it wasn't fair i wish i could get the version now i think uh we'll get into the tough stuff next but like you're coaching coaches now and, and i'm biased to this as well i feel um I feel as everyone needs a coach. I don't care if it's Michael Jordan had one, uh, Adele has one. I, I don't care where where you look, right? Um, regardless of the pro pro uh, profession, excuse me. Tell me why you think that is. Would you agree with that, I guess? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, geez, look at executive coaching. It's a, mm -hmm. a, a very well-renowned, well-known, you know, well-adopted version of what we do. So how is a CEO different to a head coach? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we all learn, we learn from each other. We go to the same conferences because our jobs are so similar. And so to sit there and say that, you know, there's a book called Trillion Dollar Coach where, you know, Bill Campbell's a former uh, football coach, college football coach and goes and mentors Steve Jobs and the, the Google CEO and the Yahoo CEO to say that that should be any different to what we do in, in sport at the elite level is kind of absurd. Uh, and so the adoption is still not there because of a number of different factors. One is organizational. The idea is we pay you to put up with all this crap. And so if you can't put up with the crap, we'll just find someone else. Uh, so we pay you handsomely basically to be miserable. So if you're unhappy being miserable, <laughs> we'll move you on. And then secondly is the, you know, the, the growth mindset side of things from coaches themselves who don't think anything's broken with them personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and that's really where the, the gold is, Kevin, is uh, there's nothing that I can teach to any coach about the game. It's about the other stuff. Yeah. The, yeah. the tough stuff. Yeah. Well, that's good. Well, the, well, the tough stuff on the good stuff show here, right? I mean, th this, yeah. this book, um, right match th this, this book, this book is so real, man. It, it's, um, I, I appreciate your, your vulnerability and transparency with it. I, I, I think I can relate to the entire book. Um, tell me, tell me first, why did you write this one? Yeah, this one was really personal and yeah, I, I share a lot of it in the book, but uh, we had a player take his own life uh, last uh, March. And as a still young head coach, kind of going through that, and then, you know, a month later, COVID hits and just kind of sent me into a, a bit of a tailspin and thought I had it all figured out as we always do. But then, you know, something pops up where you just feel unprepared and, and it made me... One, ask questions of coaching buddies, like, how are you doing? And everyone was kind of reeling at the same time and realizing that, you know, um, they weren't doing so well. Uh, and then, yeah, as I started to dig deeper and deeper in terms of trying to find something to help myself, I realized there wasn't much about the emotional side of particularly head coaching, where you are the figurehead. 
you are the person that everyone turns to. And when, when 50 young men turn to you and say, how do we grieve? What do we do here? Like, how is this all going to transpire? Uh, that's very confronting emotionally for a head coach. And so, yeah, that was kind of a catalyst. And then I, I started just digging deeper and deeper into it. And so, yeah, there's elements of criticism and and identity and mentality and uh, connection and belonging mm-hmm. scattered throughout the book. But really the, the core of it was that, you know, I'd gone through this experience myself. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I, I literally had no idea. Um, and it's crazy because I went through that myself as well uh, as a coach. And, and uh, boy, there's another thing to relate to, right? I mean, it was, it's excruciating. Um, I, I'll never forget it being on vacation on the beach and getting the call from the superintendent in the high school. And that's just something that, that'll rock your world. It's hard to go, it's hard to go days without thinking about it, right? Um, right. How do we fix this problem, Cody? How, how do we make the, the seven hard truths about being a head coach in the front turn into the ones like the end of the book? Like that's just such a perspective shift, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of work to do. And the thing that I would say would be I want, I wanted and I still want the book to be a little bit of a a rallying cry to us as coaches to come together on this stuff. And, you know, we all deal with the issues that are in the book. And so it, it kind of needs to start from us. No one's coming to our rescue. But, you know, if we start to talk about what we go through, um, you know, publicize it, talk about it on podcasts like this, I think we can start to admit that, you know, we're better together on these issues Mm -hmm. you know these personal and emotional issues uh but yeah there's there's a couple of things i look at organizations and how organizations are structured and really we're we've kind of made this world which is quite bizarre where we're almost at loggerheads so either the coach is at loggerheads with the organization or there's organizational politics going on that detracts from your ability to have access to your talent you know that 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 poli- the, the the politics of it all detract from your ability to lead, and so you know there's there's an organizational structure element to getting this right, and then there's definitely a team element, and I think that's how we talk about what coaching is in the modern world and how it's going to transpire, and and actually verbalizing it to our teams and talking about what we go through as coaches and how, you know, even explaining simple terms that we just throw out there now, like what the hell does coach them up mean? What does that mean? <laughs> like I, I see, you know, I, I, I'm on social media a lot and I see that term. What does that mean? Mm. If you can't explain that to, to, a, to an athlete, what it actually means, what I'm responsible for and how we're going to interact whilst I'm coaching you up, that's the level that we need to get to. So build those relationships um, based on what you believe coaching to be, not what they think coaching is from their previous relationships with coaches. So there's a middle ground there. Mm -hmm. So think about like macro organizational, probably micro um, the team and then your relationships with the athletes. And then the individual is the third part, which is the work we need to do on ourselves. Yeah, that's, and, that's huge. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and that's probably the biggest one. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, how many coaches, I'd be curious to know, like how many coaches you think out there have something unique, something they want to try that nobody else is trying, but they're not doing it because maybe they, they, they've got fear. Maybe 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 they're worried about the criticism they're going to face. You know, I had a, 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 sorry to ask a question and give you a point here, but like a, there was a coach on here before, Kevin Kelly. He's the football coach that never punts. You know, whether you agree or disagree with him, I have the utmost respect for his conviction and belief in his system and what he's doing and then selling that as he coaches him up to his kids. Right. Like and and he has to deal with a lot of criticism, probably more now as if, if he'd have done it 20 years ago, it wouldn't have been as bad. But right. how many coaches out there, Cody, 
just can't be themselves because of some of those. And I just listed fear and I just listed criticism. There's so many more, but how, yeah. how much is that existing right now? Right. Well, you have to imagine it's most of us because often we get head coaching roles because of our innovation in tactics and, and, and techniques and things like that. Right. Like you, if you think about just football, right. So you kind of go, you come through, go up you know you might be a defensive coordinator and you're trying different things and so that makes people take notice of your system but then you get into the head role and you kind of freeze up a little bit and maybe you don't continue to innovate in such a way or you're fearful of putting those innovations into practice because of the criticism uh and and so the answer is most and and we get dragged into you know what i call the game like the game has an idea of how things should look. So even if you were to run a different practice, there's someone sitting in the stands, they might even work for our organization who says practice shouldn't look like that. Practice mm-hmm. should be clean. Practice should be this long. Practice should be, you know, it should sound like this. That's someone else's impression of, of what it should be. And often we find ourselves consciously or unconsciously pandering to that rather than making a a messy practice because the game is messy, um, which is what we might actually want to do. And so, yeah, take some, some real bravery to push those ideas through and kudos to Kevin. I I followed his career as well. And like to, to actually go and do it is, is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it really is. And it's almost like, you know, you've got the standard and then you've got the scoreboard. And it's like, I feel like you just need to set that standard and those expectations and be, you know, make them simple, make them clear within your program so that everybody knows what those are and, and you're not fighting against anything else. Right. And, and mm-hmm. I think the thing is though, it's just as coaches, I, I know I'll speak on my behalf. You can become very hypocritical. You know, I, I can sit there and bark out orders all day and I'm not doing them myself. You know, that that's something that I think is very commonplace too. And, and, and people see, see right through that. Another thing I want to touch on, you literally tweeted about this the other day is coaching instincts and feel. I, I, I wanted to dive into this when I saw this tweet a little bit, you started with this maybe wildly unpopular, but I'm big on coaching instincts. And then you ended with coaches, trust yourself, trust your gut. I got you. I was a feel coach. So I'm loving this. You know, I try to explain that sometimes to people know you're nuts. You don't have this ready. And you don't, and I mean, just walk me through this, if you will, please. Yeah, so, you know, gut feel and uh, coach's gut and instincts became dirty words through the, particularly through the Moneyball era, right, where, you know, everyone was pointing out that those aren't things. And I think maybe even to this day, Michael Lewis still doesn't think that that's a real thing. But my perspective on it is that we are in a human endeavour and even Michael Lewis couldn't argue that human beings don't have instincts, particularly for those around them. So if you think about, you know, you can feel bad for someone that you don't know just by seeing their frowning face, or you can get a a rush of adrenaline if you see someone uh, get hurt on the street and you actually rush to their aid and you turn to them. And so where we have these instincts and we have these automatic um, portions of ourselves that for the people around us that we can see and touch and feel, we have an instinct. And so to say that coaching instincts isn't a thing is absolutely ludicrous. What is probably the best outcome is some variation of the numbers that Moneyball kind of points out to us and the instincts Mm -hmm. and, and the ability to check your instincts against the numbers and decide what you want to do. But to, say to me that in a human to human endeavor that instincts shouldn't be used and and instincts are built up also from experience as coaches you you start to understand dynamics and and how things work Uh, i think we should be promoting them as well as you know the the numbers and the other things that we need to pay attention to yeah it's great i love it i love it um what what do you think is the the biggest misperception out there about coaching in general? Oh boy, how long have you got? <laughs> I could probably write a whole another book on that. 
Um, Book three. That that a modern coach needs to have all the answers. I think that's still the number one thing. And that's partially our own doing. And then partially the, you know, the probably the rapid speed of change in our sports where, you know, we also need to factor in that it was probably only 20 years ago where most pro organizations that were, you know, multi-million dollar organizations, you know, in the early 2000s probably had one head coach and an assistant coach running the whole program and so the coach did have all the answers because they kind of had to that was their job whereas now we we can't all the information is av- in the world is available you want hey you know this better than most man you want a basketball drill mm-hmm. every single one that's ever been invented is on the internet right and so that's no longer a competitive advantage of knowing everything or knowing and, and hiding. Now it's it's grabbing the right things and pulling them into your environment at, at the right time. And so, yeah, the, the coaching domain has changed because of the spread of information. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I really think you touched on COVID a little bit earlier. I, I was on a phone call with a coach last week and, you know, half her team, is just struggling with those things. I talked to my buddy, my best buddies are coaches well the week before, and it's, you're dealing with so many other things that are, are not even sports related. You know, I mean, I remember going down to the university of Florida back in the day. And I think a guy mentioned there one time during this small private clinic, 15% of what you do is actual coaching. You're doing so many other things, right. And, and, and you just, you don't know how to deal with all those things. Are there certain I don't know if you you call them tips or tools for coaches to deal with some of the stuff that you would suggest right now. Hmm. Yeah. So the number one thing is it's, it's partially identity and then I'll explain what that means. So I think we need to identify as performers ourselves. And what I mean by that is we, we do perform on a, every night basis, every second night, every weekend, our performance matters and it matters the most to our players. And so what we actually do, and I write about this in the book, is we do high-performance knowledge work. And so our our brains are our asset. All the knowledge and all the communication skills and all the empathy and all the everything that we need is stored in there. And so... Ironically, as we're pushing all of these mental skills and sleep and nutrition and hydration and all of these things on our athletes, we're doing none of that stuff, Mm -hmm. even though it's just as relevant to us in our performance and and having access to the right information uh, that we need and being able to moderate our, our emotions. And so, yeah, my number one thing is you have to think of yourself as a performer. And that means that's going to mean saying no to things because you need to go home and go to bed. It's saying you're going to have to say no to things because you need some family time on a Friday night before the big game. So you can see your daughter because you haven't seen her all week. Mm -hmm. It's going to mean that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can see where I'm going with this. And so if we are to perform at, at our optimum, like we're asking our players to, we need to live those things. Now, the great news is, Kevin, we know all the secrets of human performance. It's what we do. <laughs> we, right. we just need to we just need to apply them to ourselves. Yeah, that's. I think that's what I was alluding to earlier with you. It, it, it becomes very easy to be hypocritical. You're just caught up in it, right? Um, I want to hop in three pointers here, but I got it. We always talk on here in general. We've already mentioned to your maybe your favorite books already uh you you a big reader do you, do you have any other books that you can you can plug for for leaders out there that they should be reading oh yeah definitely yeah the the two that i've read recently so they're brand new this year and and i think need to go into any coaching toolbox belonging by owen eastwood and fear less by pippa grange mm-hmm. they kind of explain themselves in the title yeah but um, just absolutely magical thinkers, the both of them, and, and they've lived the work that they're talking about. Uh, it's, they're mostly sports examples, but it gives you a really global perspective on belonging and what it means to connect and then also fear 
and and what fear does to you, particularly as a leader. Yeah, those are good. Um, I, I got it. I've got three pointers. These three questions, but one other question. I'm gonna I'm gonna start testing with you here because I think it's a good one. I might add it to three pointers instead. Um, if you had one extra day each week, how would you use it? I would uh, spend it with my wife on the beach. There you go. I like it. Yeah. Well, there's there's a good there's a good tester to get you ready here. We're going to test out your jump shot. All right. All right. Um, three three pointers here. If if you need to take a little bit longer and you feel inclined, please do so. But number one, if people could learn one thing from this talk, Cody, and just grab hold on to it, what would you want that one thing to be? Coaches need coaches too. Amen. Number two, if, if Cody could have been in Kevin's shoes today and been behind, the, been behind the mic and asked Cody a question, what question would have you asked him that I did not ask today? <laughs> Why are you wearing a Stanford water polo <laughs> shirt? <laughs> shout out, shout out to, to John Tanner out there. He's a, an awesome coach. There you go. That's, that's, a, that's, I, I haven't heard that one yet. That's for sure. Well, Hey, finally, number three, good stuff is the name of this. Anything else that you feel uh, just some good stuff in closing or what you feel is appropriate for this conversation? Yeah, I, uh, again, this kind of comes from my, my Twitter, but it's just a stream of my consciousness really. And, and I, firstly, I, I love the name of the show. And then secondly is I added to my Twitter bio head coaching optimist because those two things together are very rarely seen. There is so much negativity around what we do and criticism of what we do that I want to turn it into optimism and say, there's so many people out there trying and learning and testing the waters and being brave and making mistakes and doubting themselves, but it's all okay. Yeah. And, and, we, we are leaders in community. We're leaders in all these different areas. We shape so many lives. And I, I want us to focus on the good stuff because coaches do so much good stuff that, yeah, let's, let's give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back for that. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Uh, I, I'm glad you said something because, you know, like the old saying is that you have a, you have an opportunity to impact more people in a year than you do in a lifetime. I think that was Billy Graham maybe. And it's, it's so true. You know, when you get that phone call five years later, that wedding invite 10 years later, um, yeah, yeah there, there's nothing like it. it it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's, it's, it's hard to put into words, right? Well, yeah. hey, let, let's touch base um, just so our listeners, let's, let's start first. Can you tell them social media wise where they can connect to you? Yeah, the great thing about having a name like Cody Royal is that I have all my own uh, handles everywhere. Uh, so I'm very easy to find. Uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, most of all. But yeah, Twitter is my my main one, Cody Royal, at Cody Royal. Okay, good. And then the website? CodyRoyal.com. Again, another benefit of having a unique name like that. Yeah. But uh, that, that houses blogs, talks that I've done, my podcast, uh, access to the books and a bit more reading on the books and, and everything is there. And you can get in touch with me through the website as well. Yeah. Just, just give us a little insight to, to your podcast. I'd be anxious to hear you. You've had some quality guests on there. You do a great job. What, what, what's that like for you and your biggest takeaways? Yeah, I started mine as my own coach, Ed, really, you know, being an Aussie rules coach in Toronto, Canada, there's not many conferences you can go to for Aussie rules coaches. And so I thought stuff that I'll start my own and, uh, yeah, initially the idea was to pair together someone from business and someone from sport and a bit of a panel interview and talk about the same things. But honestly, Kevin, and, and you know this, the best thing, about, well, there's two, two great things about the podcast. One, you get the condensed learning of the greatest people in the world at what they do in an, in an hour and it becomes your learning. Mm -hmm. So that's absolutely magical. But then the second thing is the friendships. Yep. And so the people that I've had on my podcast, I speak to most of them still text and share ideas and see them when I'm in New York or Sacramento or Los Angeles or yep. wherever. That's really cool that you can just get together for one hour and then become lifelong friends. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's great. Well, Cody, uh, man, what you're doing is great. I, I, um, I have the utmost respect for it. Thanks for, thanks for diving into something that's so real and, and, and needs to be addressed. Um, best of luck to you here. I, ho- I hope we can stay in touch and, uh, I, I thank you for just being on here and spending some time with us today. Yeah. Thanks mate. I appreciate it and keep doing good stuff. Yeah, you got it. We will. Well, hey, uh, <laughs> if you need a coach, he's your guy. Check out all those, uh, the social media, get to his website. And if you need another podcast to listen to as well, it is good stuff. So thanks again for joining us. And until next time, good stuff.